Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Plimpton School Committee meeting for Monday, February 22nd. Um, we're expecting a good sized crowd tonight. Um, we're going to have a little bit of business, then we'll get to probably what most people are wanting to talk to uh, about tonight, although you're welcome to join us for the entire meeting if you would like. Um, we'll get to the plan for increased in-person learning uh, in just a little bit. But um, first, we need to... Um, we need to, the other part of this meeting is actually a, the official public budget hearing. Uh, so we need to uh, call that to order. Um, and uh, so we'll do that part right now. And if anyone has any public comment that they would like to make regarding the budget for the Dennett, that is something you can do now. If you would like to make a comment, I'd ask that you just note so in the chat section and I will recognize you. Um, if no one feels at this point like they want to make a public comment regarding the budget, we will be talking about the budget at some length uh, later in the meeting. Um, so this is usually when we start saying Bueller, Bueller. Okay, I've been doing this. This is my seventh year of doing this. I've yet to have someone make a comment during this period. I would ask, uh, we need a motion to conclude the public budget hearing since no one has been interested to do that. Um, I would look I'd like to make a motion to close the public comment for the FY22 budget for the Plimpton Elementary School. Okay, and can I have a second? Trash. A second. Okay, uh, all in favor, we'll do a roll call. Uh, Mr. Frazier? Yes. Ms. Hempel? Yes. Mr. Antone? Yes. And uh, is Dan on? I don't see him on my screen. Okay, not yet. Uh, I am a yes, John, so that's uh, it's enough to close the public budget hearing. Okay. Um, moving on here. Um, did folks have an opportunity? Well, Clearly, we have a significant number of visitors, so that's the acknowledgement of visitors. We can just look on Zoom for that. Um, and then uh, for approval of minutes, did folks have an opportunity to review the minutes from January 25th? Make a motion to approve the minutes from our January 25th, 2021 meeting. Okay. Do I have a second? Yeah. I'll second. A second from Mr. Antone. Uh, and then we'll do a roll call again. Mr. Frazier? Yes. Ms. Hempel? Yes. Mr. Antone? Yes. And uh, I am a yes as well. It's John Williamson. And uh, Mr. Cadigan, are you on yet? No? Okay. So minutes are approved. And then on to uh, school committee correspondence. Um, Mr. Frazier, I believe we had um, some correspondence that you wanted to uh, just speak to? Yes, um, there was a public request made for the letter that I sent as an individual school committee member to the governor on November 9th. So I'd like to read that into the record. Governor Baker, thank you for your interest in returning the students of the Commonwealth to our public schools when it's safe to do so. As a school committee member, I have intimate knowledge of our transportation capabilities, HVAC status, spacing issues, and an open dialogue with our local board of health and health agent who work to provide us with the best information on local conditions in our community in relation to the status of COVID-19. I appreciate your attention to reopening all our schools fully and I will definitely smile when that day arrives. My hope is that as a former school committee member yourself, that you, your secretary of education, and commissioner can work with the school committee members across the state to help solve many of the problems we are facing. I believe that you've done a great job dealing with this terrible multifaceted emergency and cannot think of another governor who has done a better job. However, your messaging and the messaging of your administration towards public school districts and committees has not always been received as constructive. I understand the frustration of not being able to bring all kids back to school right now. 
Every school committee member thinks about this on a daily basis. I know everyone is working hard to provide the best possible education for their kids while keeping them safe, keeping them, the staff, and our community safe. I would love to have your help with some other ideas that many school committee members have been working on for a while. Work with us to realize the Student Opportunity Act to help us deal with the incredible cost of transportation to join us in a push for full funding of IDEA, which already has bipartisan and bicameral support in Washington, DC, and stand with us in a call to pass the federal infrastructure bill, which would include up to $100 billion for our aging public schools. I believe we could open more schools then. I believe we could address a number of the equity issues between districts who can safely educate their students in person and those who cannot. I welcome working with you moving forward. Jason Frazier, Plimpton School Committee. So I just wanted to make it very clear that our engagement as individuals and as an association, because I'm also on the board of directors for the Mass Association of School Committees, has been constructively working towards opening schools more fully in safe ways to bring our students back into class to get as much face-to-face -face time with their teachers as possible. I think there might have been some confusion about that issue, so I just wanted to uh, have an opportunity to read that to the public tonight. Thank you. And um, I think uh, what we'll also do is we'll um, look to add that letter as well as the joint letter from the MASC and the Superintendents Association uh, to these minutes, as well as the minutes that were uh, previously approved for December. That way they're there and easy for folks to be able to, to get. Um, just, uh, just also to note, we've, you know, we've had a number of uh, communications directly with uh, members of the community uh, over the last month since our last school committee meeting, which either Dr. Prue or myself have responded to. Um, and we appreciate the, the input and the feedback that folks have had provided to get us to tonight. So thank you for that. Um, I don't think we have anything else in correspondence that we need to address right now. No? Okay. Uh, negotiations. Uh, we are in, in uh, negotiations, um, a number of different negotiations with respect to contracts for the upcoming year. Uh, but we will be talking about those uh, during our executive session uh, quite a bit later this evening. Um, so really nothing to add there. Uh, so that brings us to the exciting part of the evening, talk about the plan for increase in person learning. Uh, let me just go over a little bit about how we're going to how we're going to try and have this discussion with this many folks. Um, Mr. Benito is going to, uh, I believe, present the plan. Um, we will then give the opportunity for uh, school committee members to ask any questions, make any comments, and we'll go through that process. After we have finished that process, we'll look to take any uh, comments or questions from those of you who have joined us this evening. Um, that said, this is a little different than the uh, parent information session that we conducted a week and a half ago. Um, we do have a full agenda tonight. So what we will do um, to when we get to that question period, and we'll remind you again for that, is we'll look for folks to, um, in, to note in the chat that they would like to ask a question. Uh, I will then recognize you uh, at your turn. Uh, and please keep any question or comments to three minutes or less. Uh, we will then go through everybody one time through to make sure that they have an opportunity to ask questions any questions or providing comments or feedback. And then if we still have uh, plenty of time, we'll come back around for another round. Um, but we also have the budget to get through tonight as well. So that's gonna take us some time too, but we don't wanna shortchange this in any way. Um, so to that end, uh, Mr. Benito, would you like to, uh, to take it away? Yes, thank you, John. <clears throat> I'm gonna try to share my screen right now. Okay. Can 
folks see that? Yes. All right. So I think it's important to note that um, once again, our staff, we want kids back in the building uh, just as much as anybody does. And again, the emphasis, and we've been saying this for a long time, is we need to make sure that we can do so in a safe manner. So this uh, presentation is about six or seven slides long. And if you'd like, um, if you'd let me get through it, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I think one of the frustrations that I'm hearing from families is that people want school as it was back in 2019. We can't quite do that yet, but I think this is a decent compromise. So let's, uh, let's take a look. We have certain state regulations that of course have been kind of the hurdles in all of this. Um, February 11th, we were fortunate enough that the capacity limitations and physical distancing requirements for students on buses were lifted. Uh, that's a huge obstacle for us, which is now not in the way. Second regulations that we must abide is the social distancing at lunch. Um, space and supervision remain an issue in some schools as we must provide six feet social distancing. And again, that social distancing piece is what's really kind of, it, it's definitely an obstacle. Um, six feet is still recommended by the state and CDC. Three to six feet is allowed at DESE. Uh, less social distancing means more potential close contacts. It's important to note that decisions to apply a three feet minimum will likely increase the number of close contacts. We had that happen in kindergarten associated with the occurrence of a case. More close contacts may impact our ability. Uh, school spread may also force us to go remote. So therefore I am proposing the following. I'd like to try to get kids back five days a week, 8.30 to 12.30 live in person at Dennett. Um, there would also be somewhat of an afternoon component, which might be a little bit more of a remote nature. But let me just kind of go through some of these benefits here. In our current hybrid model, we're offering 12 hours of face-to-face -face learning. It's, it's a good model. It's not, it's not fantastic. Um, under the new guideline or the new plan, we would be able to do 20 hours of live in-person learning with the potential for an additional four hours of online learning. Um, what's good about that provides in-person learning every day and avoids lunch challenges. We would not be serving lunch under this model. At 12.30, kids would go home, have their lunch and recess, and there would be, as I said, some kind of an online component at that time to wrap up the day. And I think one of the most important things, even more important than the academic side, is the social and emotional benefits for all kids. They need to be together. They need to be with their teacher. They need to have face-to-face -face learning. And this would provide a lot more of that, probably close to double. Not serving lunch affords us space in the cafeteria for classrooms. We currently have two grade levels that cannot use their classrooms just because of uh, the six foot distancing. So we would be able to use that space if necessary. Uh, right now, if we were to put all the cafeteria furniture back into classrooms, I don't have enough surfaces for the kids to eat on. Uh, we're searching high and low for things like that. Um, but if that were to be the case, we, we wouldn't have to buy anything new for the calf. And having that afternoon time, it, it serves a couple of different purposes. Um, I've heard from my teaching staff that having time on Wednesdays to work together and collaborate is huge. And with all the planning that needs to go on for this, I would like to try to leave that in place for Wednesdays. But that would give us Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, afternoon learning and for instruction and or PD time for staff. Now, while there are benefits, there are certainly challenges as well. We would need to get a survey out, a survey needed to understand which students will be live in attendance for five days. Um, some families may be comfortable with this new model, some may not. Uh, the survey needs to get out quickly. I'd like to try to put this model into place for March 22nd, which is the beginning of our term three. Uh, transportation, although the restrictions on the bus have lifted, uh, a challenge is going to be whether or not first student can accommodate our 830 to 1230 proposal. Definitely a challenge is going to be drop off and pick up will be longer. If people want to, if more people want to use the bus, that's terrific. But I think a lot of our parents are still very comfortable with drop off and pick up. Um, that just because of the sheer volume that, that will take longer. Uh, we need to take a good hard look at our remote teachers. We still have a, about 10% of our population that is, according to our current information in cohort C, I want to make sure that we can still accommodate those students effectively. 
Um, space does, does become an issue. The CAF and gym may need to become classroom spaces. Our gym classes would not be able to be held in the gym. And we currently don't have a Wi-Fi signal in the gym. I've addressed this with the tech team, and they are on top of that. So if we need to use the gym, we can do it. No lunches served means the cafeteria staff will need to organize lunches to be sent home to families, uh, most likely in the form of a grab and go at the front of the bus as they leave school or at parent pickup. Similar idea with breakfast, they'll need to be grab and go and eaten in the classrooms where we can do it. And we were taking a good hard look at the building today and it will take a little bit of time to rearrange classrooms, furniture, if teachers need to move, because we do potentially have four classrooms that may, may need to relocate. So in order to get this schedule up and running, immediate next steps that I see, um, I need to know what the capabilities of first student are, feasibility of the new schedule to be coordinated with Silver Lake because we have shared buses. As I mentioned before, definitely need to get a survey out to families. I need to know who plans on being in the building and um, be able to, as I said before, be able to make sure that uh, we're taking care of all the co uh, cohorts appropriately. And again, based on survey results, we need to assign and possibly hire teaching staff for cohort C. Right now, budgetary implications, none at this time. I think as we gather more information about what are our families looking to do, it, it is possible that additional staff might be necessary depending on the percentage of students who might choose remote. So that is an awful lot to take in. So if school committee would like to start off, as John said, uh, please feel free. So um, just so we can keep this clean, I'm just gonna kind of call and see if you guys have comments or thoughts uh, Mr. Anton, maybe I'd start with you. Do you have any thoughts or comments you'd like to add? Sorry, I just had on mute. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter, for putting this together. The, do we have um, uh, current bus numbers, uh, students on the buses right now? Um, looking at? Yes, I think, I think that, that would be a critical part of the, the new information moving forward, Mike. Um, I don't know if the bus, again, there's so many unknowns right now, but I don't know if the bus restrictions being lifted, if people are going to feel more comfortable sending students on the bus. So that would be a key part on the survey. Right. But we're still seeing, we're still seeing, uh, the strong drop-offs and pickups that we, that we typically see anyways. Yes, yes so. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how, how would we be, uh, to handle, uh, obviously, there's going to be some extra cleaning involved um, because we're going to use the calf in in the gym. Um, do we do we need to uh, staff? Do we need to find another person, or or would we be would we be good with what we have in the building at present? I think we'd be good to start, um, and and I communicate with our custodial staff well enough to know if, if they have more needs, if they need bigger machines, if they need more sprayers, th those are all things that can be done. Right. And this is, and this is this, this model that, 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 that we're looking at now is, we're still keeping everything at six feet. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's, that's what I'll have for it right now. Um, Ms. Hempel, would you, do you have any comments, questions for Mr. Benito? Yes, thanks, John. Um, first, I have a quick question, Peter. Was lunch in the classrooms considered? Yes, it was. And what were the reasons behind not doing that? I mean, because when I went to school, we ate in the classrooms. You know, I know it was many years ago, but we did have that option. I'm just wondering why that wasn't, where we could do it at six feet, why that wasn't a viable option. One of the biggest challenges to that, Amy, would have been coverage to actually cover and um, just have supervision on the children. When we're in the CAF, I can have one to two adults that can watch up to six classes at a time. And just the physical limitations of that one lunch where I do have three grade levels going, I, I don't have the staff to do six different classrooms at one time. 
so you couldn't do like two grades and have what well, I would mean four teachers or four aides or four specialists stand in a classroom. And I know it's going to take a lot longer for lunch, but that wasn't an option. Um, we considered it. I think right now we have staff spread out so razor thin to take away from time with kids. Um, that would definitely be a challenge. Um, was there a reason we only got one proposal? I know with the high school, they had two. So I was just being nosy why we only had one. Um, this, this was the best I could do right now. Okay. I think that's it for me. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Mr. Frazier. So, um, Peter, with the two days a week that the kids are going right now, they're attending about six hours a day, correct? Yes. And, and during that six hours, um, not all of that six hours is instructional time because of lunch and recess, correct? Lunch and recess is about 50 minutes. So it's, it's an hour. Okay. So with your proposal getting closer to 20, we're, we're basically doubling the in-person learning time that the kids are going to be able to have doubling in in-person learning jason but also if you tack on another potential hour of remote learning at the end of the day say two to three we're almost replicating the ex almost the exact same minutes as we would during a typical school year and I, you know i i did a lot of listening over the past couple of weeks to people's frustrations with with how schooling had been going since september and i know that you know, the consistency of having a routine every single day was important to a lot of these kids and a lot of their families. So I appreciate the five days a week instead of looking at Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, or some other model. Um, but I also heard a lot of frustration with the on the computer remote learning that especially a lot of our younger students had to do. Are you thinking potentially that the afternoon work could be asynchronous learning or are you still thinking that would be online? I think depending on the grade level, Jason, it could be either one. I definitely heard from a lot of our younger or parents of younger students. And the last thing they want is any more online time. Um, but I think in some of the upper grade levels, concentrate on ELA and math face to face, perhaps do some science, social studies in the afternoon. It's going to look different at every grade level, which is the beauty and the challenge of having kindergarten through grade six. And my last question was, um, in the spring, I, I had the opportunity to work with Megan Aaronholtz, our food service director, when she was doing the grab and goes when the schools were completely shut down. Um, have you had an opportunity to talk with her yet about how we could have the grab and goes, um, you know, function at our school for, for the pickup line and for the kids on the bus? I have not had that conversation yet. Sure, she'll have some good advice and some good experience from what she went through back in the spring. Um, I appreciate uh, the plan and, and, and doubling the kids' face-to-face -face learning time and having the five days a week of consistency for those kids. I, I appreciate the plan, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, did, did uh, Dan Cadigan join yet? Okay. Um, so, Mr. Benito, did, I know that we're presented with only a single plan, but my assumption is this was not the only thing that was being thought through as you were working on this over the last couple of weeks. No, we've been we've been pretty busy. My okay. Um, do we um, my thing is do we have any? Um, so we haven't we haven't yet communicated regarding the bus, and so that's that's one piece that we may need to be flexible or adjust that to some extent, depending on not only what I guess first student does, but to some extent what Silver Lake does. That we did, that has definitely been discussed, John. And if Silver Lake decides to take times that are a little bit closer to our start times, I, I think that schedule can be adjusted if, if we need to do half an hour before, or half an hour later, we, we can work with that. Okay. Um, and then um, I guess just one of the pieces that I, I guess I would highlight is that, you know, the hope is, is that we can make this work with our existing staff. But if we do need to hire staff, is the potential that that would, is, is there a potential that that could, could impact timing on this? Yes. 
because we've had some difficulties more recently in trying to get staff in the building, right? Very fair point, yes. And I think the other thing that I, I would like to just call attention to with this is that it, it certainly appears that we're looking to support both the, the you know, five-day in-person learning, but we also need to continue to support our remote students. And that's, that's what we've sort of agreed to do at the beginning of the year. And, and if we're making this change, we can't leave them out uh, of this. And we have to make sure that we have the appropriate staff to do that. But of course, this will, um, this will be dependent upon the surveys that we get back. Yeah, the, 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 the cohort C <clears throat> model is going to be a little bit more challenging. Um, I have many of my staff that are, are, are working to, to try to work that through, but it, it, it is going to look a little bit different. Um, and like I said, we need time together. I mean, we just had a week off, which was wonderful, but um, we need time together as a staff to figure this out, just like we did in August. Okay. And so apparently uh, we were John. Thinking. Yep. John. Yep. Yes, Jason. So, so Peter, uh, in terms of cohort C, um, I just know that the state put out guidance in December about um, trying to make sure we have 35 hours of synchronous learning every 10 days. Will we be able to maintain the 35 hours of synchronous learning for our cohort C students? We're working on that right now. But, but that's, the, that's the intent. The intent right. is to, to deliver a Dennett education to our cohort C students. Um, it likely will look a little bit different, but we're not looking to, to, to push that off or to change that in such a way that it would be dramatically different. That's the goal, yes. Right. Um, and and I, know that, I know that it does look different today because there is more. We have, I believe, the cohort C students are interacting some with the other students that are remote during those days. Like so on a, like a cohort B, Monday, Tuesday, they're remote, as are the cohort C students. And I assume that there's some intermixing there that that would, of course, change. Most likely, yes. <clears throat> so, John, my, my final statement is I'd just like to request that the plan, if we're trying to do uh, 40 hours for our in-person, we also try and do the 40 hours for our cohort C as well. Uh, I know what the state regulation says, but in that effort to have equity to make sure that we maintain that as well. Amy or Mike, any, any additional comments or questions before we sort of open this up? I just have one quick question. Sure. Um, so right now, busing is if you live within two miles of the school, you have to bring your kids in. That's how it was set up. So I live within two miles. So my thought is I have to pick my kids up every day at 1230 and bring them at 830. Is there any way around that? I think I think we try to work with our families as best we could to try to accommodate. Did, 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 That's did, hard for a lot of working families. What do they do? Yeah, did, you know, at 1230 in the afternoon, my job isn't two hours long. It's, you know, it's a full day. So it becomes an inc I have to have somebody bring my kid home, which defeats the point of, you know, separation. Or I have to, you know, I have no other idea what I'm going to do at this point. So I'm just thinking, at least the other way, I had two full days where I knew my kids were in school, two full days. It was a little mm -hmm. bit different. Yes. But Peter, I, I wasn't, were we, I didn't think that we had with the original busing, I thought we offered the busing to, we didn't put that restriction, even though that is in the, that's in the law that we don't have to offer that. And I don't think there's any intent at this point with the lifting of the bus restrictions to place any additional restrictions on that or say, oh, well, if you live, you know, 1.9 miles away, tough, you're going to have to, you're required to bring your student. I think the goal would be to, that that's going to be part of the survey. And then we're going to look to accommodate the students on the bus according to the guidelines that, right. that remain. Right. But then schooling will also continue at home. So it's not like you can just have your kids dropped off and Good luck. You know, you have to, if somebody has to be there. So. 
Well, I think that just, well, I mean, so I guess to that extent, maybe that's part of the feedback. I mean, if, if we are doing synchronous learning, then that's different than asynchronous, which is with respect to, um, with respect to the time of day that that happens, you know, that, you know, that's a way of something to think about, uh, and whether, you know, that makes it easier or, or harder. I don't know. I think the hardest part, John, was that <clears throat> it, it is going to have to be a compromise. Like I said, I, I wish that I could provide school from 2019, but um, there were going to be some things that were going to be shortfalls in the plan. And, and yeah, I, I totally acknowledge what Amy's saying. That's going to be challenging for some families. Okay. Any other comments from the school committee? Questions? Okay, if, if uh, folks who are on the call would like to ask a question, please just note that in the, in the chat section. Uh, that button can be found in the middle of the bottom of your screen. You can click on that. Um, Nikki Mahoney, would you like to ask your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, so to, not, obviously the model is not going to look like 2019, like Mr. Benito indicated, but um, if accommodations are made that six feet is allotted in all of the classrooms with the use of the space, is there any consideration for um, lunch aides or, you know, parent volunteers uh, to come in and alleviate the stress for, for watching classrooms while they eat, if they're able to eat in the classroom? I would say yes. One of the challenges also is that when you're in the classroom within at six feet, that is, um, it definitely becomes a challenge. And also, I think try, trying to, I'll just leave it at that. It's still going to be a challenge, but I, I do, I, I definitely would be open to people possibly coming in to try to help out. Okay. I mean, I think reasonably, you know, all the parents are, 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 open and, and willing to help, you know, in any way we can, um, you know, for the common goal. So I think expectations would be, you know, temperature check, health screen for anybody that was going to volunteer and clearly, you know, leave a mask on and stay six feet away um, to try to mitigate any obstacle in the classroom. But I, but I do think we would need to limit how many people are coming in. So I think you couldn't, it wouldn't be advisable to have a different parent, let's just say, for instance, parent volunteer in each classroom, each different day of the five days a week, because then you're then you're introducing a lot more people into the into the school, which is part of the one of the mitigation measures that we've that we've that we have in place. Um, but I think it's something we can certainly look at. And then oh, yeah. I, th I think as, as parents, you know, if I don't think we would would flock in 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 a, in a group, I mean, I think there would be, you know, if, if certain people consistently can sign up and, and be the ones to be there, um, I, I agree. I think that would be best to minimize. Um, and then I did have a second question, um, kind of follow, following up on what Amy mentioned, um, afternoon sessions. So if, if the kids go half day and then there's a, an expectation for afternoon sessions, um, I know everyone's situation is different, but what if kids who are picked up or get off the bus aren't able to then log back into the afternoon session because accommodations are being made that maybe they are going home with a grandparent or, you know, another childcare alternative um, and that they just don't have access for the afternoon session. Is there like a contingency or an expectation as to how they'll fulfill those hours? I think the staff has done a really nice job <clears throat> to not penalize kids who are having technical difficulties or who can't get online. Um, so that would, that would definitely be something to consider. Absolutely. Okay. No, I appreciate it. I mean, they've been fantastic. I don't think there's a, a, a penalization factor. I think it's just from a parental factor, wanting them to maximize, you know, the education that's there for them. But I sure. do. Appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, uh, Angela Wilbur. I uh, yes. I um, was just curious if this was a short-term plan that would be with the goal to increase more in-person um, shortly after, or is this the plan that's being proposed for the rest of the school year? I 
I would say that that I, I think as we get more information and we get more data about how how well we're doing mitigating everything, um, perhaps it might be a bridge plan until we can get more information in, um, until we can get whatever staff members want to be vaccinated can get the vaccination. I know that got pushed back a little bit. Um, but I, I do think this is a step in the right direction. It's getting a lot more in face, uh, face to face rather. Um, I think it's a movement in the right direction. I just had another comment. Um, and I do appreciate that this is more in person um, learning. I'm a bit, I'm a bit taken aback. I th think I was expecting sort of a worst case scenario of adding every other Wednesday or sort of a best case scenario of um, at four full days with, the, with allowing the teachers to still have Wednesdays for planning and keeping a half hybrid or remote. Um, so I'll, I'll just say as like a working parent to piggyback on what Amy was saying, this plan is a logistical nightmare for me. Um, and I'm sure many other parents, I literally cannot leave my job for 45 minutes every day to be in a pickup line. So my children would have to be on the bus or utilizing neighbors and friends and increasing exposure. Um, certainly there are some pros to this plan, more, some more in-person learning, definitely some structure um, for kids, definitely increased peer group. Um, no lunch, uh, you know, is a huge social component for kids. So I um, feel like there are solutions for that. So I would like those to be exhausted, I think, before just eliminating that option. And I just want to personally just say that, you know, Kingston has already voted to go back full time. Kingston Elementary School and Intermediate School, they're going back five full days. Halifax is likely, very likely going to be voting on March 1st for five full days. And so I'm just wondering how our families in Plimpton and this administration feels about Plimpton being the only elementary school in our district who will likely be at five half days if this plan go, were to go through and how our kids would likely be behind both academically and socially and emotionally and how people feel about that. I know that part of the reason, a big part of the reason why I moved to Plimpton was because of the excellent school at Dennett, the dedicated teachers, the small child to teacher ratio, the low turnover. And now it's starting to feel like if we're the only school within our district that isn't gonna be the five full days or that have that option, that we're at a disadvantage. Um, so just wanted to put those points out. Well, I would just I would just note that, I mean, we call these half days, but they're not half days. I mean, we're talking about four full hours of, of instruction for each of those days. And a normal school day, you have five. Yes. I assume they're five. also gonna have snack also, so that would be a break too. Sure, Which but you would have snack in, in, the, in a regular model as well. Right, um, And then the other point that I would note is this allows us to maintain the six feet, um, which also reduces your opportunity for close contacts. Um, and that's an intermediate step, perhaps. And maybe if when we get to the point that we have, you know, we have vaccinations made available, then that gives us an opportunity to reduce that mitigation of six feet. But this is, I think, a plan that that dramatically increases the amount of in-person learning. I understand that it has logistical issues and challenges, um, but we can. that's part of why we're having the discussion here to be able to hear what some of those are and take back some of the comments and see if there's additional things that can be done to this. Again, Mr. Benito worked, I think, very hard to kind of put this together. And this is the first opportunity that we've had as a group to be able to talk about it. So there's clearly gonna be additional work that we will need to do and also to adjust based on the information that we get back for the noted uh, contingencies that are already in the plan. So I think more to come. Uh, let me see here, uh, Katrina Player. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I actually have two questions, but I'll keep them quick. Um, the first one is um, Mr. Benito mentioned that there would be a survey coming out about the five half days. Um, would it be an option for the parents to say, we'd rather keep it the way that it is now? Cause I, I agree with Amy. I think that having my kids in school two full days is going to be easier than five half days. Uh, the school committee can discuss that. We haven't had an opportunity to, to speak, uh, to how we want, how we would suggest the survey be done. 
Um, so that will be something we'll have that discussion after we're done with this feedback. Okay, thank you. And my second question is, I know sometimes, um, or it seems like often decisions are made based on vaccine availability for the teachers. And I just wanted to know if the staff at the Dennett have been polled to see who is willing to get the vaccine. It seems like there's a lot of people who aren't going to want it. So is that gonna affect a plan going forward? Any of our thinking, at least from the school committee perspective, well, I would speak for myself. <laughs> Let me speak for myself because I don't think the school committee has discussed this specifically. But the way that I view this is that when the vaccine is available and, uh, and, available and staff has the opportunity to get both doses of the vaccine and go through that period, it's not that everybody's going to do it, but that it's been made available and that they get through that period where we can then relax that that measure because you're we're, again we're not only trying to keep our teachers safe and healthy which is always a primary concern but it's also that we're trying to make sure that school stays in session and if we end up with close contacts and we have to knock out a class we don't have the we don't have the mechanism to support that unless the whole class goes out and then the teacher and those students can be remote if it's part of a class or it's it's other things like that, or it's a couple classes, we don't have the automatic ability to drop into remote because we have that currently running, you know, in the in the same way because we have half the students remote on any day. So um, from my perspective, the availability uh, uh, to obtain and go through that vaccination process is what we're looking at, not that every single individual at the Dennett is vaccinated if they choose not to do so. And if other school committee members have other thoughts on that, please feel free to do that. Well, I just think it's, in, it's important to note that the CDC on February 11th said that anybody 10 days after their second dose no longer has to quarantine. Um, so getting the teachers vaccinated is not part of the plan that Peter just um, put forth to us, but that would definitely be something um, that could move us forward in addressing uh, a more aggressive plan in the future, I think. Okay. Uh, Scott Devonshire. Hi, John, this is Tori Devonshire. Hi. Um, so I had a question in regard to cohort C um, and if any had consideration been put into live streaming classes so that they don't lose all peer interaction and become completely isolated. Yeah. Good point. What you say? I actually had that conversation with several teachers today. Um, it, it presents its own series of challenges in that we're not sure of the audio capability, the, the challenge of the teachers don't just teach obviously from one spot in the classroom and it's, it's going to be an issue. We were looking at it for one particular grade level today. Um, and there were some concern from the teachers that would the student be able to follow along? Would I be able to more appropriately get them involved in, in class conversation? The, the visual part was probably the hardest. That, that was the conclusion that we came to. Um, I think if we can test the audio capabilities, at the very least, they'd be able to hear what is going on, what's being said. Definitely something we need to explore. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I kind of had a second part to my question. So if cohort C students um, are able to go to an in-person model, um, would you flip to a completely remote for just an affected class or would it be a whole grade of close contacts um, depending on exposure? I think the latter part of your comment would probably be the most accurate. Um, and, and we've been very fortunate so far. I think the measures that we've taken have been effective, but with the situation that we had in kindergarten, we had one entire cohort that we had to send out because we couldn't guarantee that they were further apart than six feet for 15 minutes. So I, I can't give you a totally clear answer on that, but I, I think it's a very, very much a case by case basis. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Katie Rondo. Yes, hi, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Benito, I just want to start by saying thank you um, for looking at it and addressing it and trying to get our kids back in school. The first question I have is that I now have talent at the middle school and I know that a final decision has not been made yet, but we did receive our survey and um, their busing dismissal time is at 1220. <laughs> and again, I don't know if that's going to move forward, but if it is to, it's 10 minutes apart from the Dennett dismissal time. Do we know how that's going to affect busing and transportation in that afternoon? That's definitely going to be a problem if that's, if that is approved. Um, and like I said, with, with our schedules, if we need to adjust, either go half an hour later, half an hour before, um, we, we, we can certainly do that. And first student has been, they, they, historically, they've been very good about working with us to make sure that we, that they're providing the correct service for all of our kids. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, that was just one question I had because I'm like, I don't know how they're both going to get on the bus at the same time. Um, and I know that I was vocal during the last meeting in regards to lunch, but I just wanted to um, second that I am on staff for Silver Lake for an assistant to the lunch. And I am more than willing to come in five days a week to assist Pam um, if Jamie's not available or if she's looking for another assistant. And I know Julie's always in there um, and the other lunch aid, if that is at all helpful to you in potentially moving forward with a delivery grab and go lunch cart to the four classrooms during the lunch periods. If, if it is at all helpful to offer lunch as we are breakfast in order to do full days or that later bus time, if it does end up in turn conflicting with the dismissal, the dismissal time for the middle school. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Ryan Brosnan. If you may still be on mute. Uh, we'll come back. Uh, Mrs. Walker. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm just going to keep it quick and say, um, Mr. V, thanks for working so hard on making a plan. I know your uh, vacation week was consumed with trying to problem solve. Um, and I just want to let people know that this what today, what you're hearing is not far off from what we started with last summer, how we were trying to really problem solve and come to the answers to all the questions. And I know at the beginning of looking at the plans, we couldn't come up with one you know, we couldn't come up with answers immediately because there were so many what ifs and how to's and that we had to come up with. But, um, and Mr. V. Oops. And you wanna, you wanna mute. You've done to try to help us. And uh, I just want people to rest assured that whatever plan we come up with, you know, with this plan, we will work very hard to make it, uh, you know, as strong and as um, successful as possible. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ryan Brosnan, do you have a comment? Um, if for some reason you're not able to get the, be able to speak the question, you feel free to put it in the chat and we'll, we'll try and answer. <laughs> I just texted mom. Okay. Um, moving along here. Uh, uh, Michelle Ruxton. Hi. Um, I think a few people before me have already touched upon this, but um, I just want to say I appreciate the plan that was presented. Thank you for that. Um, and also appreciate the disclosure of the more children you have in the building at the same time, the higher the area for potential COVID cases, right? That's just simple math. Um, the reason I say I appreciate that is because I felt like that was missing on part of Silver Lake High School's survey and disclosure um, that we also received. And their dismissal time, by the way, is 1245 for the plan they did. So again, same problem. Um, 
in terms of dismissal. So having one student being picked up in Kingston at 1245 and the other one at Dennett at 1230 with the car line seems a little tricky since I'd prefer to transport them. Although, like Amy said, that's going to be a logistical nightmare for myself as a working parent. Um, so you may not know the answer to this part. Um, sorry, let me back up. I just, if that could be just considered for the school committee to include that as part of the survey, if there are siblings that would be affected at a certain school. So maybe we can try to figure, maybe I pick one kid up and the other kid takes the bus. I'm not depending on the occupancy of the bus, I guess, would be a decision-making factor for me. Um, but my question is more about, um, in terms of potential exposure, if a child was identified as a close contact, is there an opportunity for them? Do they just jump into remote? Is it a packet of work that we come pick up? I'm not sure if that has been kind of teased out yet. Um, or like you were saying before, like the whole kindergarten cohort, if something like that were to happen, um, I guess I just get a little nervous about the, the what ifs on the bigger end. Yeah, Michelle, that's a great point. <clears throat> that came up at a staff meeting today as well. Um, oh, yeah. one, of the one of the benefits to the current model that we're using is if a child is absent, they have the ability to be remote for that day. If someone has the sniffles, they can be remote for that day. Um, which is something Why that not a lot of other towns are are able to offer. So that's one of the benefits so of the hybrid model. However, we may not be able to do that if we move forward. That that's one of the things that, as you said, it still needs to be teased out. Uh, just comment on that, Peter. Though one of the reasons that I've been uh, a stickler about the six foot distance is because of how many letters we've gotten about. There's been a student with COVID at one of the schools in our Union 31 and no close contacts has been on a lot of those letters because of the six feet of distance. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm so adamant in maintaining that. So we don't have the close contacts, uh, which is still being defined as less than six feet of distance for 15 minutes of cumulative time per day. So if we can maintain that six foot of distance, we shouldn't have too many of those close contact situations, even with a more full school. So there's no, just to recap, there's no third party platform that exists as of now. We just have to figure it out as we go, kind of. I think that's a fair assessment, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back, uh, Ryan Brosnan. You able? Do you have a, still have a question? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, I had reached out to Mr. Venito. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for trying to make the plan for the kids to have more in-person learning. I did reach out to Mr. Venito and um, was looking for a potential sub job to try to help out with some of these staffing issues. Um, I would just wanted to comment that I would be very much willing to come in as a teacher's aide, um, or I'm sorry, a lunch aide, five days a week, unpaid, whatever it needs to be done to, you know, help alleviate some of these pressures that these working families will, you know, be facing with that new schedule. Um, so just a quick comment. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Heather Eddy. Hi, thank you. Um, my question was answered earlier, but I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. We were just talking about the six feet of distance within the classrooms. Um, so the way that this plan works with the kids coming back in, um, every classroom has that six feet of distance, correct? Every classroom with the exception of grades five and one. And that's what we're working on right now is what other spaces can we use within the school and we we at first glance it looks like we have a lot of space and, and quite frankly we don't um one of the one of the moves that i think is probably going to be necessary for one of the grade levels just to be in the cafeteria unfortunately okay so there, there's still details to be worked out for those two grades many yes many okay thank you you're welcome Okay, uh, uh, we've gone through the list. Uh, Tori Devonshire, do you have another comment? Yes, question? thank you. Sorry, one more question. 
Yep. Um, so where this is looking to be implemented prior to April vacation, um, are you going to be requiring students to quarantine that have traveled after April vacation? And if so, how would you accommodate them if we no longer have the synchronous learning platform? I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if I may, Nurse Fox, um, you're probably more intimately aware of the governor's travel. I, I, I'm not sure. Perhaps you'd like to comment on how would we, how do we manage that? Or not? I mean, I, I I'll take a stab. Um, I mean, if, if the governor's, if the governor, if, if we still come April vacation have travel restrictions and requirements that the, that the governor has put out for the state, then we would be required to, we would require, people should be following that. Um, you're right, if that, if that, if that restrictions are still in place and people are away for April vacation and travel to a, a place where that's not on this on the safe list, which I'm not sure what is on the safe list anymore. I think Hawaii, <laughs> other than that, um, hopefully there'll be more on that list. Um, but if, if you're not, if it's not on that list, then um, we would not have that platform to be able to just move as Mr. Benito was saying seamlessly on a day out or a week out to into that sort of full remote for that period of time. Um, and so what that would look like at this point, I don't think we know whether they could join with cohort C uh, or whether it would have to be asynchronous uh, for that period. That's one of the downsides to a model where we have sort of everyone in all the time. Um, so that, that is a challenge because we don't have that backstop. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, Jessica Kinsman. Yes, I just have a question for Mr. Venito. Mr. Venito, going back to your presentation that you started with this evening, you had made mention of potentially needing to hire staff for cohort C. And I just would like you, if you could, I know you're still in the planning phases, but if you could take a minute to kind of provide us with, your, with what your original thoughts are. Um, would we be in a situation where our cohort C students would lose their teachers and be placed with new faculty members? Or what are you thinking at this time? Great question. And to be truthful, that is a possible scenario. Um, obviously, if the teachers are teaching the bulk of the time to the students in front of them, they, they can't be necessarily doing the same for cohort C. That would necessitate more staff. Okay, so um, additionally, how would you handle a situation where you have potentially just one or two or just a couple of students that remain remote while their peers are, are in school every day? I had probably a dozen conversations with teachers today on that very topic, and it's something that we, we need to work on. We need to figure it out a little bit better than what we have right now. Okay. And would there be any scenario in which the teacher remains with the cohort C students and a new person who's hired is in the classroom? And I ask that only because I feel like as a parent of a cohort C, two cohort C students who do not want to be cohort C students, um, I feel like, you know, you guys are in there doing the best you can do every day and you have to juggle a million things. But I feel like there's been times where they've kind of gotten the, the short end. For example, like when, when specialists went back to being in person, that was fantastic for those kids. But for kids in cohort C, that meant 40 more minutes of looking at a computer each day. Or things like, you know, fourth grade has already dealt with a transition for um, mid-year after Mrs. Reynolds retired. And I guess just in an effort to advocate for, for those students, is there a way of doing this in a way that there are as few transitions as possible to support kids who had to deal with transitions already. Yeah, I, I can tell you that based on the conversations I had today, our, our, our cohort C kids are top of the, of the list of, of priorities of how can we make this work for them. So I think that our plan moving forward 
is fantastic for let's call it 90% of our kids, but I am still very much concerned about how we're going to give that same level of effort support um, for cohort C, which is why in the slideshow I put, it, it may require additional staff. That's, that's a very realistic possibility. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I know that this is never gonna look perfect for everybody, so I appreciate you taking the time to think about it. Absolutely. I, Mrs. Kinsman, I've been thinking about it since March 13th, I promise you. John, if I could uh, piggyback on that for a sec. Um, so again, you know, I, I'm hearing about some of the concern with kids having to log on and get into face-to-face -face learning opportunities, synchronous learning with teachers uh, after school gets out. Um, I'm also hearing that we might have staffing issues with meeting cohort C students. So um, continuing to evolve thoughts and listen to feedback, wouldn't it make sense to utilize our, our Dennett staff in their afternoons to do that live instruction with our cohort C students? And again, potentially give our students what looks more like a traditional homework uh, assignment, uh, an asynchronous assignment to do at home, at, at their leisure whenever parents may get home to assist them. Yep, that definitely came up today too, Jason. We had, after um, after our staff meeting, I went to each individual grade level and I basically put myself out there and said, what do you think? And um, by the end of the day today at three o'clock, I felt like our teaching staff had already wrapped their heads around this problem very much the way that they did in, let's call it July and August. Um, I kind of challenge them to think outside the box a little. How can we do this? We don't have all of the answers right now. I recognize that. Um, but I can assure you that, that we have some really excellent people that are working to address this. And, and we want what everybody else wants. We want, we want what is best for all of our kids. And we'll, we will be working tirelessly to provide that. I don't think you are. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Lindsay Platts. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for all the time you've put in. Um, I just have a couple questions, mostly regarding lunch, as that seems to be the biggest hurdle why the children can't be in for a full day. Um, obviously, they have the option to eat breakfast in the classrooms. They also have snack within the classroom. Um, so I guess my biggest question is why they can't also have lunch in the classroom or also even divide into two groups like a group A, group B within each classroom. Group A stays in the classroom for lunch. Group B goes to the cafeteria. We're not over flooding the cafeteria. They now have the same amount, if not less, than they had than they have now. Um, and the the lunch staff and maybe custodial staff brings a cart, you know, of grab and go lunches directly to the classroom for however many students remain there. Um, it just seems that if they can eat snack there, they can eat breakfast there, at least some of them should be able to eat lunch there, especially as most of the classrooms are able to keep the six foot distance. I know that first and fifth, I have a first grader. I understand that um, may not be able to maintain the six foot distance within the classrooms that we currently have, but if only half of them were left in the classroom to be eating, then that would solve that issue. I think the challenge there is that depending on the numbers that we get back for the survey, the cafeteria might, might need to be both sides of it because we can, we can close it off. And we may very well have to have both sides of the cafeteria become classrooms. Um, therefore, I couldn't have anybody eating in there because there, there would be teaching going on during someone's lunchtime. And was that, would they need to be classrooms for only first and fifth grade? Potentially, yes. And was the gym um, cut out from the equation? No, gym is very much still in the picture, although I was in there talking to some teachers the other day when they were having lunch, and Mrs. Lynch was doing a basketball lesson, a fine lesson, and the kids were dribbling, and there was music playing, and it was a great PE lesson, but I was on the other side of the gym, and I said, I can't imagine trying to do a phonics lesson in here right now or teach a, a grade five um, social studies lesson. It, it was, it would have been a major challenge. 
So I mean, I, I think that the I think the the point is two things uh, pick up on one is that to make this plan work, we're likely going to need to use all the space we have, which includes the gym and the cafeteria. Again, depending on the numbers that come back, if 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 we can utilize existing classrooms and keep six feet, then then great. That makes it easier. Uh, the other piece is is that the the teachers aren't teachers. That's part of their part of their time to do well to have lunch and to to do their their own work during the day. It's not time that they're typically in the classroom, and that's where the issue comes up with who's going to be there to watch the students because that's why they typically go to the go for you know lunch and recess. That's a for the teachers to have their time during the day to be able to get their work done that they need to to be able to function. So it's that's where that question comes. If everyone's eating in the classroom, how are we going to spread that out? And how many people do we need to help do that? Which are all be, things that are going to be looked at, figure that out. Um, but that's sort of where those concerns come from. Would it be possible to add maybe a line within the survey um, asking parents who who are available and who would be willing to donate their time essentially to the greater good. I know personally, I mean, I had to leave my job back in the summer. So I've been staying at home with my kids since then. Um, both of my, both sets of grandparents for my children were recently vaccinated. So I now some relief for childcare is on the horizon and I would be more than willing to come in five days a week if that's what it took to be a lunch aid. And I would be happy to do that. And I can probably think of a few other parents as well. Is it possible to maybe add that into the survey to kind of get a feel? And I understand we don't want to have, you know, a random assortment of, of anyone coming in and out of the school. But if we had a set group of people who were screened, who, you know, you do a temp check, who are committed, um, you know, to volunteer their time um, for the kids, I, I think that might be a worthwhile thing to explore. I think as Mr. Venuto says, we're constantly gathering more information. So if this is a thread that we should gather, we'll gather it and see what that does to help formulate the plan. I mean, we're, we're I guess I would say we're a lot better at this than we were in the summer. Um, we've learned a lot, but you know, and this is gonna be a compressed time frame, which is kind of crazy to think about everything that we did in the couple months in the summer from July to the September 16th. And this is even more compressed, but this is an initial plan that we could that we believe we could make work and if we can adjust it to make it even better i think that's that's sort of the goal and that's part of the reason why we ha have a discussion like this at a public meeting so that we can get that input and be able to refine it and make it a better plan just like getting input from the teachers this afternoon that mr benito was talking about you know, this is this is how we make it better and how we do the best thing we can for the community. Uh, Allison, uh, you had a question. If you're trying to respond, you might be on mute. Hello. Yep. Hold on a second. Sorry, I'm not very good with computers. Hello, this is actually Jeff Oz, not Allison. I'm just using my wife's computer. No, that's fine. It's, this is what happens. Um, so I've been, you know, sitting here tonight and listening to everything that everyone has to say. Um, and I do appreciate the fact that the school has, has presented us with a plan. Um, and obviously time was spent on it and that's appreciated. Unfortunately, it seems like there's couple major flaws with the plan. The idea of having the school day end in the middle of the day um, creates tons of issues for parents that are working. It's almost worse, like some other parents said, than what we're currently doing now. It's like ruining five days instead of three. Um, and it's just, it's, that's not, it's just not going to work. That's not going to be a plan that's going to work. It's not, it's, it's not better. It's not better than what we're already doing. And I, and I understand that everyone, you know, has a different opinion about the COVID virus. It's, and, and I understand that the kids need to be safe in school. That all makes sense. The problem is, is that I have a different opinion than you and, and, you know, you have a different opinion than someone else. We all have our own opinions. The one thing that I think that we can all agree on is that in-person learning 
is superior to remote learning. And the older, the younger that the children get, the more critical it is that they be in school. The kids go into school for 40% of the school week has not been working. And I understand that we needed to do that in the beginning, that there was no choice. We have choices now. There are other models out there of schools that are successfully going in person. We have a small elementary school and we do have challenges, but we can overcome them. And if manpower is the issue, it's already clear that this community, as it always has been in the past and will always do in the future, whatever it takes to give our children the best education that's possible. And we are not doing that right now. We are not providing our children with the best education that we could be providing them. This school board is failing us. You are failing us at the moment because we have the ability to, whatever happened in the past is over with. We can't change any of that. But the fact of the matter is that starting tonight, something's gonna happen in the future. And what needs to happen is that we need to get these kids back in school. I'm hearing, I don't know, very challenging. I understand all that. All these problems can be solved. We just need to commit to do what we need to do to get the kids back in school. I'm not the first parent here at a school board meeting, at first school board meeting, trying to open the school back up. Quite frankly, we're a little behind the curve. We can figure this out. We need to put the work in and commit to do it. It's all possible. You know, I'm hearing problems that can be solved. All these problems can be solved. We don't even need to be that creative. You know, the gym and the cafeteria obviously are the areas that we need to utilize. We need to figure out the best way to use them and we need to start acting. I have, it's time for you guys to stop thinking and, you know, considering, don't, let me finish. I've, I've listened to you this whole time. Wait, okay. I have, we've been listening to what you had to say. It's time for you to listen to us. We want our kids back in school and you can do it. Stop saying you can't because it's possible. All it takes is the commitment and, and just continuing to work at it. Peter, you need to just challenge yourself. You keep saying it's challenging. Well, continue to challenge yourself because you can't figure it out. You gave us half a plan tonight. Let's finish it. This is enough is enough. You need to, you are not helping our children. I don't want to like get into like personally, but I have two children at Dennett and one of them has a learning disability. And because of the fact that he previously had this identified, he's been able to go to school four days a week this whole time. And if it weren't for that, we probably would have to repeat him this year and he's incredibly intelligent. There are tons of kids right now that just barely missed that cut that are probably irreparably damaged. And this is because of this school board's inability to figure it out. Enough is enough. We can solve all, everything I've heard tonight is solvable. You can solve this. Be more creative. Work a little harder. It can be done. It can be done. And I know for a fact, I don't know, sir, if you have children in the school, but I do know some of the people on the school board, okay? And I'm seeing some of the people on the school board that have, you know, these kids are ready to go back. I know that there's some parents on this board that are ready to send their kids back to school because they're fine with them playing sports and they're fine with them being out in the community with their friends. It is time. Listen to your community. Put your personal feelings aside and listen to this community. I understand, sir, that you're concerned about, about the health and welfare, welfare of our children, but you are not the parent of my child. I and my wife have that covered. We don't need you to be a parent. Let us decide what's safe. Present us with a plan so that we can get our kids in full in full in-person learning and then see who decides to go back to school. 
I think you'd be surprised how many people are going to do it. If you would have done the survey you should have already done, you would know that this town overwhelmingly wants to go back to school and we're ready to do whatever it takes to make it happen. We've already said that. You can see this. My time is up. Thank you so okay. much. I apologize for, the, for exceeding the time. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Um, let's keep moving on here. Uh, let me see. Uh, Heather Eddy, looks like you had another question. Hi, yeah, I know um, that this might be a tough question to answer since this is the first time that we've heard a plan, um, but I'm just curious if there's been any thought to what the timing of the survey would be. I know that we only have school committee meetings um, once a month. I'm just wondering when that turnaround time is for parent feedback on this survey. Yeah, Dr. Pro. Sure, in the school committee's packet tonight, there are is a, um, a model survey similar to uh, surveys that have been sent out for other schools in our district. Uh, it would need to be tailored uh, to the presentation tonight and subject to the school committee's review. Also in the school committee's packet, there is a sample letter to go out to parents. Um, so the, the hope is, is um, with some guidance from the school committee, we would be able to send this out to parents um, as early as tomorrow um, and then give parents a week to fill out the survey and allow uh, Principal Venito uh, the time to take a look at that information in order to build a model. I think it's very important for people to understand that Principal Venito is working off of speculation based on numbers that he does not yet have. Uh, he cannot answer for all parents. Um, he is uh, looking at a model based upon what he thinks may happen based upon current numbers. Um, but none of us will know until those commitment forms are back. Um, and um, it would it also allow parents to to weigh in if that if the school committee so chooses to put in uh, an opinion question, for example, such as which model do you prefer? Um, that is in there also for the school committee's review. Thank you, Dr. Pro. And yep. Stephanie Turan, you had a comment question. Um, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really going to um, elaborate on my comment because I'm definitely at odds with 90% of the people on this thread. Perhaps the fact that my husband is a physician um, and I am seeing an entirely different side of this pandemic than I think a lot of people are. Um, I am seeing the side that perhaps is the scary side that makes me a bit more paranoid. Also the fact that we have two at risk people in our home. I personally greatly appreciate the great effort that this school board has gone to and Mr. Venito to make this as safe as possible and safer than other schools have been doing. Um, I have a lot of family out in Utah and they are infamous for basically taking hardly any safety precautions whatsoever. And I cannot tell you how many of my friends and their families have had COVID. I have lost family members. I have lost friends. I have lost old teachers to COVID, most of them out in Utah. Um, so I am seeing this from an entirely different point of view. It is not just the flu. Uh, my husband is fully vaccinated, thank heaven, um, but we had been fully remote this whole time because constant screening through his profession is just not enough to catch asymptomatic people. Um, there were plenty of times where he would get calls from patients who had come into appointments and didn't know that they had COVID. And then he would get calls days later saying I had COVID. And then, you know, it would, it was a constant issue with exposure for our family. And it's been absolute hell, constantly worrying about our exposure. Um, because he's fully vaccinated, we have been able to feel safe sending our kids um, into the hybrid model. Um, and again, with at-risk children, um, that was basically as comfortable as I was in, you know, letting them go to school. Um, so I, again, I am at odds with most of the parents here, but I sincerely appreciate because I know um, how many hours, countless hours 
you have put into this, regardless of what anyone thinks. I think it's very unfair to say that you have failed our children. That is absolute garbage. You guys have put in so many hours and so much stress and have lost sleep and you're racking your brains to try and make this as safe as possible. And just because everyone else is doing it is not a good reason to follow the crowd. I think that you're being very smart. Um, again, I am more paranoid than most people because I have seen so much of the devastation of COVID. Uh, my husband has many patients that have COVID and he's watched them die. And it is not something that we should be taking lightly. Um, and even those that survive, there are serious complications, long-term health effects. My mother has liver failure because she had COVID and she survived. And that's so that I, I am also, you know, concerned for the teachers. I think it is smart to take this slowly until teachers have the option to get vaccinated. I think that is a huge thing for staff and teachers to have the right to before having in-person learning. I also have friends in Duxbury. Their children have been boomeranging, boomeranging in and out of quarantine because they are all back in school. And that just simply increases your um, exposure rate. That's just math. So I appreciate what you've done. I do not believe you have failed our children. I think you have done more of a careful job than any other place that I have heard of. And also, I think it's very unfair to demand that things go back to normal because this is the first pandemic of our time. And so I don't know what timeline we're measuring acceptability against. I have I have two children who also have mental health struggles. And as I said, this has been absolute hell for our family. So I completely understand the mental exhaustion. I completely understand the in-person learning is obviously superior, but for goodness sake, we are in a pandemic and a virus does not care about your mental health, which is really unfortunate. The virus has one job, and that is to move from host to host. And us moving and congregating is making it a lot easier and a lot harder to slow it down on a larger scale. So again, I appreciate the caution that the school board has taken. I appreciate Mr. Benito's countless hours and tireless work. And I think it's really disrespectful to say that they have failed our kids. I think the opposite. But again, I know that I am not often a popular opinion in this town. That's fine with me. And I don't plan on making any more friends after this, but I just wanted to voice my opinion because I have that right. And I appreciate all the work. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Um, Mike Mikish, did you have something you wanted to speak to? Yeah, first of all, sorry for the background. I, I have no idea how to get rid of it. <laughs> uh, uh, look, I, we have to look at something. Every, everybody's voicing their opinion, which is great. Um, but you got to look back at history. So the Spanish flu wiped out much more people than COVID. And I'm not, I'm not minimizing it. I've been exposed to COVID. I've had friends who have had COVID. I've seen people who have died from COVID because of my personal job. That being said, it doesn't affect the younger kids as much. We have to take that into consideration. Again, go back, back to the Spanish flu. They held classes outside. I know that seems wild nowadays because everybody wants to make sure that everything's climate controlled and the kids are in the best environment they can be in to learn. And that's great in the best of circumstances. But right now, we don't have the best of circumstances. If lunch is the big problem, I know like a day like today, we couldn't have put them outside to eat. But have we looked at tents outside to, to feed them in? And, and again, I, I don't want to sound like a, a jerk or anything, but I was in the military for 21 years. Eating in a tent was a luxury. We, we've, we've kind of softened the kids in a lot of ways. And that's great when things are good. Things aren't good right now. But to get them together more often, and, and if that's our big, big obstacle, what a tent's going to cost us. And then from the tents, they can get outside. That matter, tents could be a classroom in the decent enough weather. So, I mean, it's something else to look at, and it's probably not a huge expense. Um, the other thing I'd look at is write a letter to the government saying, why, why don't they supply them? There's tons of military surplus stuff that gets sent off. I, I mean, it's not an immediate solution, but it's something to start looking at. And, uh, again, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that we're keeping them on a school because of one, like, hour-long period. Even if we had to break up lunches or something, the kids in school need to be in school. 
And, and again, I understand the exposure. And if people, if people have a problem because of their own personal issues and family in their households and whatnot, they keep remote as an option. I'm having a problem with the remote because it's, I know it's probably shocked to people in Clinton, but I can't get internet access. I want $10,000 to run cable down in the street to me. I'm not paying. I can't. So it, it's some other options to think about. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we need to move on at this point. I think everyone's had an opportunity to, to speak. Um, and we need to sort of start looking at some of the other things we need to look at here. Particularly, I think we need to turn our attention to the survey and what we want to be on that from a school committee perspective and administration perspective so that we can get the information necessary to figure out what the plan will end up being. And again, the plan presented tonight was the uh, initial plan prompted our discussion here and we've heard a lot of different comments. Um, so uh, I'd like to sort of turn the discussion to that at this point so that we can actually act on the survey and get the information and data that um, Mr. Benito and others need in order to um, move this along. Um, so uh, to that end, um, I think one of the things that I'd, I'd heard here this evening is that perhaps we should um, consider uh, one, not only having you know, a request about uh, information about the plan and about who intends to use the busing, um, but also to um, have as an option whether people would prefer to keep things the way they are or whether they would prefer to move to a new plan. I think the other thing that I heard is um, to ask about whether there is availability, and I'm not quite sure how we're gonna do all of this in one survey, but let's give it a whirl. Uh, if, if there are people available to help from a lunch perspective, which would perhaps enable us, and Mr. Vino, I know this needs to be looked at logistically too within the school, but perhaps enable us to have lunch within the classrooms um, because we wouldn't have the cafeteria available. And if we have the staff to support that, would there be a possibility of extending the day? Um, and if so, then perhaps the plan gets a little bit different. Um, and to that end, um, depending on the results that come back from the survey, you know, we also may need to find some time to, to have a, a brief school committee meeting to, to address that. So and I know there's not that much time in anyone's schedules, but we may need to do that because uh, March 23rd will come quickly. Other, other thoughts from school committee or administration on that? So um, it would be possible to add a line as to whether or not uh, a person would be willing to volunteer to supervise lunches. The issue will become a legal one for Peter uh, in terms of making sure that there is uh, coverage um, and that he's able to provide um, lunch breaks for, for his staff. One of the things we've asked for in the past is if people would please be willing to um, sign up to be a substitute. Um, and again, it has been very difficult to get substitutes. It's also been very difficult to fill some of our aid positions at this time as well. That's just another thing for the school committee to consider. Um, when, uh, as, we, as we look to the feasibility of this model, we need to make sure that we're able to, to staff it and to meet all of our contractual obligations as well. Um, but there's, there's no reason why we can't add a line asking whether or not people would be available to volunteer and the best way to contact them. Okay. I believe everyone has a copy of the survey as well as the letter if they want to um, take a look at that. And um, if you if you want to work off of that. I know yours would um, would need to need to be reflected to change the proposal tonight in some of the, the language, but
Yeah, so I think as long as it's as long as it's adjusted to to reflect the current plan, and adding the option, I think like, well, which was in which was in this model, uh, to have the current hybrid versus the uh, five day plan, and then we add, um, we have to have the busing in here as well. Uh, the five day versus full remote and then add in the lunch piece. And then depending on what we get from that and, and Janita, when you go through and figure out what the needs could be, we're probably gonna to need to come back and have a discussion about whether we want to adapt the plan further. Does that make sense to the other school committee members? Dr. Prue, what else do we need? Do we need additional direction from us or is that, are we good for the letter? And the um, I think, I think uh, if we could have the, the link for the, the meeting, because I think people will have questions in terms of all the questions that were asked this evening. Um, so if, if we do have a recording available, I don't know if um, they, the local cable company could provide that to us, that would be helpful. Um, I can link his presentation to this because again, I think parents who were not able to attend tonight will wanna see at the very least the slide presentation. And then uh, if it went out tomorrow, uh, would it be the will of the committee to, to give parents a, a week to complete the survey? Yeah, I mean, I wanna want I want make sure people have an opportunity to offer their thoughts because um, we had a lot of, people on the call tonight, but certainly not everybody. Um, that would be early March that we would get the survey results back. Okay. And then I guess we can, we can talk later about whether we need to pencil in a follow-up meeting just to speak to any survey results and get that on the calendar. Well, we can do that now even. Well, why don't we do this? Because we're gonna have a lot still to do tonight. Why don't we, we'll do that via email. Um, Dr. Pru, if you and Mr. Lynch can, can look at your schedules and see if there's any availability in there with all of the other meetings, and then we'll start to narrow that down and we'll work through the rest of ours and see if we where we can get something put on the calendar tentatively if we need that after the survey results come back. Because I wanna make sure that we can keep things moving along um, and that we have the, op and we can probably even get that just scheduled um, so that we don't have any issues with, um, you know, time to get it on the calendar. So we'll do that offline. We will send okay. you that. Great. All right, so uh, moving along, um, the next thing uh, under new business is school committee protocols. And I'm actually gonna ask, do we wanna talk about this or do we wanna bump this to a future meeting? <laughs> We've got a lot, lot of other things we need to get through. And I'm not sure that that's, I'm not sure we need to talk about that tonight. Does that work for folks? Yeah, okay. Um, on to unfinished business, uh, building-based substitute. Have we had any luck there, Mr. Benito? No? Okay. <laughs> well, um, and then, uh, okay, let's talk about something more fun, playground. I know that um, we sent around some, some information with respect to that. Um, do we wanna walk through that, Christine? You're on mute. Christine, you're on mute. That's okay. I should know better, huh? <laughs> um, I was so excited to talk about the playground. Um, we have in the package, you have a copy of the final plan, which is if you were standing on top of the school and looking down, this is what you would see. That's, a, that's, what you're, that's what's in the um, picture that you have. So Emmy O'Brien has had to work with um, 
Beals and Thompson, Thomas has had to work with Emmy O'Brien just to kind of fine tune some of the items that had to come up based on the actual lay of the land and what needs to happen with that. So they have had to make some, um, a few changes. They have had to take into account how the students will mainly access the playground. So that had to be addressed. Um, the entire length of the paved walkway will need to be redone. We cannot, we tried to come up with ways to only do pieces of it or parts of it, but that's not gonna work. Um, they'd, they've also talked about the addition of a fence. For right now, I'm not gonna, we can do the fence after the fact and it's not a, um, a significantly priced item. So I think that we'd be able to do that after the fact. Oh, look, the, it looks nice up there. Thank you, John, for sharing that. Yep. But there was a, um, one question that was lingering and we had originally said that we would like, part of the bid will include removing what's currently there. But they did specifically ask about the Stegosaurus climbing structure because it is newer. So they're wondering if, if there was any interest in us maintaining that. Is there any other any thoughts on that? Um, Christine, just in doing the playground project since its inception, uh, we were guided towards dismantling all of the current equipment because once we start new construction, we're not grandfathered by any of the state regulations on any existing structures. I mean, that's fine. That's why I wanted to ask tonight because there may be some, you had information that I just didn't necessarily um, wasn't aware of. So I said that I would ask the question just so it's not a lingering issue. We can resolve it. That's fine. And just so that I'm oriented correctly, is the walkway that's on the left of the screen, is that the existing walkway that we would be redoing? My understanding is that the walkway will be, be in a similar position to where it is right now, but it will need to be broken down to have the correct pitch. That's, the, that's what the issue is with the walkway. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah, and I'm not. I'm not so sure about the whole fence thing. I mean, I've, well, that's. I think that we can let we can we could do that after the fact if that was the decision that we'd like to go with. But for right now, I was not going to include it as part of the bid package. Yeah, I mean, what was the what was the thinking for the fence? I think part of it, it is did? that we're. It was to stop students from going down the hill, and I think it was to kind of keep them in the within the perimeter of the playground and not to but, wander off too much. But don't don't. Don't the students like also play soccer and other things in the in the in the back and then we'll pretend, we'll pretend we're in the real world again without all of this stuff. I mean, can they use the full space there and both the, the the equipment but also the open space? Yeah, John. The the open space now is going to be more to the right of the diagram that we're looking at right now. Yeah. So that'll that'll uh, definitely still be an option. Okay. I mean, I just, I just look at that much fencing and I, I start getting concerned of cost. Right. If I guess if it all doesn't, and then, and then maintenance too. I don't know what the proposal is. We had actually thought about something more in the, well, just in the discussions, something more like a split rail fence. We weren't looking for um, anything more elaborate than that because we didn't want it to become an, um, an impediment when there's snow to be removed and things like that. And that would need a lot of maintenance. So this is just a question that I said I would throw out. So for right now, I'm not going to include in the bid, but I. Why don't, why don't we? Why don't we put it as an alternate? We can. And that way we can. I mean, if it all if it all works and fits, then we can make that decision at the point that we accept the bid. You know, that way it's not it's not part of it, but it's it's an it's an add on if we if we want to and if it makes sense. And that way we can. As, have as an aside, John, um, you know, in working on the project uh, when Peter and I were talking to the consultants and the builders, we were trying to avoid as much maintenance on his staff as possible because he right. runs a very tight ship and takes care of the buildings and grounds with his three people who also clean our building too. Um, you know, just the fact that every year we have to go in and we have to put the wood chip mulch into the areas where compression can happen. Um, you know, it's going to take a couple of days uh, from the summer cleaning schedule of, of the staff already. So uh, I, I would really shy away from uh, the fencing unless it's a safety issue. Yeah, it's going to make it harder to get the wood chips in there. You Thank you. I just wanted to bring these questions up just so that you had an idea of what was going on with some of the discussions that we've had and you folks had a chance to weigh in instead of me thinking I had an awesome idea and then not realizing how it fits into the bigger picture. And the, the one thing I don't see on this diagram is the um, 
is the rubberized surfacing as to where that 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 goes and as far as what that provides access to for students that would need that as, as opposed to you know the wood chips well it will be the rubberized surface i'm not sure if i have a picture here that would include so that is on that is on one of the diagrams to it show is, it is part of it is part of the package of what we would be going out to bid for okay all right I can ask if I can get a better um, presentation of that and send it out to you folks. See so if you can just see. Uh, yeah, I just it just was one of the things I didn't see on this versus what I've seen on the other ones that we've seen going along. So, okay. Are there any questions on that? Is there? I mean, I will ask about that about the um, presentation of the rubberized surface, and the fence is not going to be part of the main bid for now, and and we will remove all existing equipment, including the the more recent climbing structure that was purchased. Well, I, th and I think we're, we're saying that to not follow my thought of, of doing an alternate that I don't think we want the fencing at all because it's going to impede um, efficiently maintaining the playground. And if it ends up being something that we could discuss it later, if it ends up being a concern. Yep. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, come on. Back to my agenda here. Um, okay. Uh, as far as the power lines, they look to be in the same location as they've been. I know that we're finally starting to get some traction there, but um, I assume that hasn't happened in the last couple of days since I've it been. Hasn't, it has not happened in the last couple of days. And um, our facilities director, Matt Jerky, did reach out to his person, the contact he has, and they were surprised that it had not been taken care of yet. It, so he was actually putting in a second work order ticket today just to confirm that if there was something that got in the way, I, I'm not sure. But we are not going to let them forget about it. <laughs> At some point, we're just going to show up and it's going to be fixed. Uh, it will be. I've asked um, Mrs. Hansen to send me a picture that day when she drives in and those wires are fixed. I, I'm going to put that on my board. I want to see that. Great. Um, not not really too much to update on, on the solar project. Um, you know we're, we're plugging along and i have some documents that we need to need to read uh, we have draft language to go on uh town meeting warrant about that um and probably have some materials that we need, need to get to an attorney to take a look at for the for the for the town and again for folks that that aren't aware we're looking at um, putting solar panels in the back part of the of the of the school where we have the metal uh, blue roof um, which uh, will enable us to generate some of the power for um, generate power for the uh, for the building, which will be a nice, nice improvement for that. Um, moving on to standing committees administrative review. Yeah, we John, we met tonight. Um, we uh, we reorganize uh, because um, you know, we haven't met in a while. Uh, Paula Hatch uh will chair um, the subcommittee um we reviewed um three uh contracts uh that that um, will go forth uh, to the unit 31. Um, we also spoke uh about the superintendent's uh entry plan and review um, that'll have to um, um get worked on by all the all the committee members um and I believe Jill, did you say uh, was it the fifteenth? That was the the our um, goal is the fifteenth. Goal fifteenth. Um, as far as the um, those contracts, uh, we're not discussing any of that until we move to thirty-one, right, Jill? That's right. Well, okay. So, um, and I think that's I think that was it. No, I'm muted. Uh, negotiations, um, you know, we are we 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 have met with the Plumpton Teachers Association, and we are going to be meeting uh, with the with the aides, um, and meetings are ongoing with that. Um, but since those are active negotiations, um, we won't be sharing anything about that tonight. But we will have a discussion in executive session. Uh, Union Thirty One. Um, I know we did. Uh, we did meet. We did meet. Um, it's a bit of a blur at this point. 
uh, we approved some approved some contracts or we approved the shared cost budget. That's yeah, we met on the eleventh, right? And we um, reviewed the um, the shared cost um, budget. So, um, and I believe that's um, we just. I mean, we're still waiting. I, I believe on all the towns to see where, where we're going to be at. Um, um, again, this year is, is budget time. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of restraints on budgets again. Okay. So there's more work to do there. Right. Um, for PAC, um, Dan, did you end up joining since we last asked? Okay, so we'll have to wait till next time for update for PAC. And then policy. Um, I would appreciate a wave of the actual read of the first reading of the policies. Okay, so I would I would move that. Uh, do we have a second? Amy or Mike? A second. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> all right, so um, yeah, the policy subcommittee is a group of all of the school committees, uh, Plimpton, Halifax, Kingston, and Silver Lake. And we met with the superintendent and reviewed um, about 35 policies. And these are the ones that we have brought forth for your consideration tonight. So I would like to make a motion to accept as a first reading policy ACAB, BEDH, IC slash ICA, ID, IGA, IGB, IHB, IHBEA, JBB, JEB, JF, JFBB-1, JH, JHD, JICFA, JICH, JIH, JH, JJH-R, JLA, JLCB, JLCC, JRA, JRD. Okay, do we have a second? I second. Okay. All in favor, we'll do a roll call. Uh, Ms. Hempel? Yes. Mr. Frazier? Yes. Mr. Antone? Yes. And John Wilhelmson is a yes. And I appreciate you waving the actual read. <laughs> I do too. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have anything under capital improvement. Mr. Frazier, anything from a legislative perspective? Absolutely. So the governor has put out his uh, state budget and uh, Plimpton looks to be receiving a level funds uh, for chapter 70 for next year. So we're not seeing any cut um, to the amount of state aid um, directly allocated to our school. Um, we do not receive a tremendous amount of state aid for the Dennett, um, but what we do get is appreciated. Um, the state is considering increasing funding for schools this year under um, a provision called the Student Opportunity Act. Right now, Governor Baker doesn't see a financial way to make that a reality. However, um, down at Capitol Hill, uh, the budget that is being presented, um, the budget package by President Biden does have $1.9 billion for K-12 schools in Massachusetts uh, directly in the line items with another $2 billion uh, in general state aid for Massachusetts. So we could potentially be seeing uh, close to $4 billion coming from that federal package if it's passed in Washington. Um, additionally, um, I don't know if you had the opportunity to see, but uh, Chief Silva, um, other boards of health and health agents all across Massachusetts are decrying the most recent move uh, to take away regional and local control over vaccination attempts. Um, many towns and municipalities had spent hundreds and thousands of dollars setting up to be COVID sites under the guidance of the state, and then they changed their minds and are going with mass vaccination sites instead. Um, so that's something that um, the Mass Association of School Committees has been involved with, with advocating that those COVID-19 vaccination doses are administered locally. Um, and another item that um, the health agents of the South Shore and um, MASC have been fighting for is to move teachers to the top of um, the top of the list of um, employees who would be getting the vaccination next. 
uh, with full acknowledgement that the seniors, um, people with comorbidities and doctors and first responders, police, fire and EMTs needed it before us. However, um, we do think that the teachers need to be vaccinated, especially with CDC's guidance that came out on February 11th, stating that if they have their two doses, they do not have to quarantine, allowing us to keep our schools open, hopefully, uh, more fully. Okay. Any questions? Okay. I'm uh, moving on to single, single signature warrants. Um, thank you. Earlier today, eight warrants totaling $107,168.08 were sent for electronic signature to the superintendent and John Williamson as chair. And just before the meeting, they were approved. So I'll be getting those to the town hall either tomorrow or Wednesday morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, Dennett Health and Safety Advisory Committee, um, that did meet uh, just about two weeks ago. Um, to uh, And during that uh, committee meeting, we did talk about sort of the current state of things at the school and also um, talked through sort of the concept of what sort of planning could go on uh, to get more time in school for the students um, and any sort of high level concerns that that we may have from a from a teaching administrative uh, school committee perspective. Um, and then, uh, of course, we had that meeting in order to be able to sort of level set as to where things were. We then had the uh, parent information session and took information from there. And then Mr. Benito, of course, went off and spent his uh, week off uh, putting together a plan. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, that committee will, will likely, I would think we will meet again between now and our next regularly scheduled uh, school committee meeting. But uh, before we set some time for that, we'll wanna make sure we get that uh, additional school committee meeting on the calendar uh, because that takes a priority over a subcommittee meeting. So it's an update for that. Um, going along, uh, Ms. Hempel, do we have any updates from CASA? We have a few things. Um, they had their staff luncheon um, the week before break that was very successful. Uh, I think they're planning on trying to do it every month, which will be great. Um, all the raffle baskets are put together for the winter festival um, and they will be on display this week and next, I believe. Forms and information to buy the tickets will be coming home this week or be sent via email. Um, they're also going to be working on or coming out with Denna and Plimpton masks. So that'll be nice. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Benito, over to you. Um, you. You've summed up a lot of what's been happening recently, John, already and uh, throughout the course of the meeting. Um, one of the more exciting things that's happened, at least for our staff, is our PD day today. Uh, we had a tremendous speaker, very motivational, very, um, very positive, super shot in the arm type of a guy named Jimmy Casas, who's written a book called... Um, I'm blanking right now. Culture eyes. <laughs> um, it was a super day. The staff got a chance to then break up into uh, breakout groups with people that they don't necessarily need to or, or, or don't work with or see on a regular basis and had some really awesome conversation around that. So that was great. Um, as far as any kind of staff news, Mrs. Kidd had her baby, uh, both mom and baby are happy and healthy. Um, I was able to lean on a colleague of mine to get a long-term sub for that grade three position. So I'm absolutely thrilled about that. Um, so we are, are doing our best to, to move forward during these challenging times. Any questions for Mr. Benito? No. Okay. Um, Christine, it's to you for the financial update. That came a little faster than I was uh, expecting. Um, in your package tonight, you have a, a, the current financial and everything that we are aware of is included in that financial at this time. As you can imagine, the focus has been on keeping the schools going and keeping students in school. The financial is pretty much the same as what you saw last month. There aren't, there aren't a lot of changes that have happened. Um, presently, the special education accounts all have sufficient balances to end the year with tuition, transportation, and contracted services. 
out of district vocational. We're projecting a surplus of $47,000 for this year. And right now we are currently not accessing any CARES Act funds. We're waiting to see if there are additional allotments or what does come up with the stimulus funding. So we're kind of in a, every, every, all the bigger items that we had targeted have all been taken care of and been paid through for through the CARES Act. So we have nothing presently that we're expecting to put through there. Are there any questions? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Dr. Pro. Good evening. Uh, tonight, I will provide you with an overview of our proposed preliminary budget. Uh, the first item in your packet uh, that we usually look to at this time of year is the students attending in-state and out of, out of state parochial schools and private schools and our K through six students attending charter schools. So in the chart, uh, the first chart, you'll see that the number of students attending parochial schools has increased by five since last year. It is down, however, overall since 2016, when it was uh, 11 students versus seven uh, attending private schools. K through six attending charter schools has remained the same. There are no Plimpton students attending charter schools. And if I may share my screen for the budget. Um, Everyone able to see that? Yep, thank you. Okay. So the last time, oops, sorry. The last time we met, we went over the core values that we used to help shape this process and help determine uh, what would be included in the budget. And, and Mr. Venito was specifically asked to prepare a level services budget. What specifically would he need in order to maintain the staffing and servicing that he currently has in his building? Um, The preliminary budget is um, based upon uh, a number of different things. Circuit Breaker was uh, is in there at 55%. Uh, and then I have listed for you the regular day increase, um, the total budget increase, and then certain assumptions that we discussed last time we met, which is um, that this budget assumes a full in-person return. Um, it does not assume a hybrid. It does not assume that we would still be required to require um, to provide remote learning. If those things were to happen, uh, there, there could, as you know, be additional costs, but this budget is assuming a full in-person return. We are able to offset one kindergarten faculty with 22,000 um, with the REAP grant, and it's no longer anticipated. We have, in fact, applied for it. Um, I completed that application last week. That, that REAP grant is um, $3,000 less than, than last year, however. The substitute utilities and homeless transportation are, um, are what we had originally requested before the FY21 cut. There is savings from one retirement. And we mentioned last time that there are three placements budgeted for out of district vocational, but we won't have that information until April 1st. That is the deadline for out of district vocational. Um, the shared costs have not been updated to reflect the impact to the FY22 budget. Um, that will be about a $900 decrease for Clinton. And I mentioned to you before that it does not include any additional staffing that may be necessary if we find ourselves with certain requirements um, per regulations from the state with regards to COVID. And um, we also don't know what the potential enrollment may be for kindergarten. And we have asked all of our elementary principals to begin that process and to have a, encourage our parents to enroll as, as soon as possible to help inform our staffing. And um, they, they have put together um, a plan and um, hope to have stronger numbers for us with regards to kindergarten needs sooner rather than later because of the, the um, number of student parents who may have kept their students home from kindergarten this year because of the pandemic in particular. Uh, we also know that there are people are concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on learning. And there are uh, steps that we have taken to anticipate these potential needs. Uh, we do qualify for ESSER grants and we anticipate that there will be um, summer programming to address potential learning gaps. 
We also have our student support teams and we'll also continue our work with curricular alignment, helping all students meet the state standards. But there are a number of resources included in this budget that are specifically designed to support, but also challenge student learning in 2021. And they are listed here for you. And they were also presented to you by our curriculum coordinator, Melissa Farrell. So this is very much um, on our mind, making sure that we continue to meet the needs of our learners and to challenge them um, despite uh, whatever setbacks there may be from the pandemic. And then uh, Principal Venito has provided us with his anticipated class sizes, but again, um, we expect some fluctuation and his budget is based upon these. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Venito because he has some budgetary information to share. Thanks, Jill. Um, what you see on the left-hand side are our current numbers by grade level. Uh, and I think, I think what is particularly difficult this year, moving into next year, is we initially, before COVID happened, we had our kindergarten numbers were up over 40. Um, as, as the pandemic continued, uh, some of our families opted to not send their students, which I completely understand. So the challenge for us essentially is do, do we know how many of those families are gonna send their children back to us requesting a kindergarten experience or are some of them going to be looking for a first grade experience? So based on the numbers from last year, we, I tried to add those families in, conservatively thinking that it might be around 40 for kindergarten next year. Um, I believe some of our preliminary information is that we have 29 families committed right now, uh, but it, this is still very early in the ball game to be making those kinds of decisions. That's, um, that's one of the hardest parts every year. And this year where we had so many families that backed out last year, we're trying to reach out to them and figure out, okay, we need some real numbers here. So some of the capital projects that we're going to be looking at, and um, some of these do need to be taken care of sooner than others. The fire suppression system, um, Matt Durkee has been phenomenal about getting information to me in a timely manner. So just let me briefly go over that. Um, the current fire suppression, suppression system is in working order, ready to suppress a building fire, not a problem. The issue with that system is that the control floats in the 6,000 gallon underground water storage tank. Um, they're not working properly. Uh, these will have to be replaced, rehung, or untangled. There's also a small amount of organic material floating at the tank's bottom that will need to be removed. So Matt was able to get essentially four different bodies together to get this thing taken care of. Um, City Point Fire, our alarm company, Weber Electric, Indian Head Water Transportation, all need to be on site on the same day to fix the problem. Um, so we're looking at around a $5,000 job between those four, uh, those four institutions. Um, the, other, I, the other items that need to be looked at are driveway, parking lot, seal coating. It, it, it's starting to get rough again. Um, he indicated to me that the entire driveway and parking lot, crack filling, seal coating, line striping is about a $27,000 job. Parking lot starting at the circle with crack fill, seal coat, line stripe, about 20,750. And just the parking lot itself to crack fill seal coat line stripe is about 14,000. Um, we have also indicated that it would be our desire to, if we have additional funds at any point, um, we're one of the only schools that I've ever been to that doesn't actually have parking spaces right outside the front door. Um, it would be a luxury certainly at this stage of the game, but that would be something that we would look to add if possible. And again, um, as Mr. Wilmson made reference to, we are looking to institute a full-time building sub at the cost of approximately $27,000. So our next steps is the school committee's review of the FY22 budget, um, review the capital plan priorities and engagement with community stakeholders. Um, we did uh, last time receive a request to consider increasing the professional development line. Um, so Christine did look at the last, um, I think it was the last five years uh, for professional development. And I, I believe um, the last five years, the average budgeted amount was 10,800. So that's also something for the school committee to consider if that is the will of the committee to go in that direction. It was presented to us last time 
Um, and so we wanted to share that, that data with you. Yeah, um, I was the person who made that request, Jill. I appreciate you highlighting that. And again, um, it's in direct response to the fact that we have decreased federal funds for teacher development, and we have a younger staff who need to attain master's degrees and maintain their certifications. So it only makes sense that um, with the demographics of our current staff that we have more funds uh, available for their professional development. And I just add for that, that in 2018, we increased those amounts for the tuition reimbursement from 4,000 a year to 12,000 a year. Uh, so if I look at the past five years, as Jill had mentioned, the average um, budget has been 10,800 and the av average expenditure has been 6,300. Right, okay. So the expenditure per year has been using about half of what we currently have allocated? Maybe 60 percentage, but right. It hasn't been using the full allocation. Okay. That's, so not, that okay, that's good to know as well. So if we're not hitting up against that that benchmark, then uh, I'm fine with the current 12,000 as proposed. Thank you. If I recall correctly, I think we made that change in the budget because we were we were we were regularly bumping up against, if not exceeding, that. And so the goal is to try and make sure that we not only address that problem, but made sure we had enough room. We had one year, we had a $4,000 budget and we had over $10,000 in expenditures. Okay. So which part do we want to talk about first? Um, I mean, I, I think, I think the, from my perspective, we're looking at just the overall main budget. I mean, I think, you know, we did look at that in some detail last time. And I think that, that the places where we have increases are very logical um, and it's, it's not a rich budget. And the other piece that we have to recall, of course, is that last year we delivered a budget that came in at 1.6% at the request of, of the finance committee, which is extremely low even for Plimpton standards in order to be able to meet, um, meet, our, meet our sort of average increase. You know, if we if we end up with a budget, uh, you know, 2.9 to even 3.5, that's a very reasonable budget. Um, so there's, you know, there's a little bit of that coming in here. Plus, we also have a change in some of the, you know, in how we're delivering the curriculum and the costs there are, you know, you, you don't just buy a textbook and use it for 10 years anymore. There's there's sort of recurring costs that that are starting to show up in the budget, which we saw. So did folks have any, any other things that they saw in the budget that they wanted to bring up with the general budget? No? Okay. Then I, I guess looking at some of the, of the alternate items, I, I do think that we need to, we need to uh, both with the, the building substitute as well as some of the unknowns and the assumptions with our budget, we probably need to <clears throat> ballpark what that might be. So if we do have to offer uh, remote learning in the fall, uh, I'm not, I don't think we should be looking to budget that at this point, but I think we need to, when we sit down with the finance committee, we need to understand what, you know, what the unknowns mean. Um, so that includes, you know, the, the, the full building substitute is a little cleaner to understand what that means. And then that's one of those things do you, where we can sit down and ask, do you want us to include that in the budget or do you want to, to fund that outside or do we want to, uh, or is there a desire to, to wait and see as we get through the end of the school year and into the early summer and understanding what school might look like uh, come September and do you wanna deal with it at that point? And the same I think goes for, you know, if, if we in figuring out, you know, regardless of, of what our plan looks like for March, April, May, June, we're gonna to start to have an idea of what it will, what sort of impact it has on our staff with respect to um, how much st additional staff we may need to be able to deal with, um, to deal with uh, remote learning if that ends up being a case. And I think we should make sure that um, we have some idea of that in order to sit down with the finance committee because it's an unknown cost and we don't know, you know, that, that could change very greatly depending on, 
if we, one, if we even have remote and two, if um, we have it, who needs it? You know, if it's, if it's a group of children within one grade, that's a lot easier to handle than if it's the same group of five children spread out across five grades. So, you know, I think we need to make sure that, that their understanding of what the challenges may be and that we have agreement on how we will, how we will fund or source that um, should we need to access it. Any other thoughts on that? No, that, that makes sense, John. And, um, you know, I, I do know that MASC and um, DESI is suggesting that people have considerations for potential remote components to next year. So we'll need, we'll need to make sure. And then, and then I think the other piece we need to give them a heads up on is with respect to kindergarten. You know, I mean, we're looking to try and try and gain that understanding, but it's also possible that, um, you know, that we get the commitments that we get early on here, but we haven't even been through the spring or summer real estate season and what that may cause additional impacts to the point that we have classes that are, that are, are too big for kindergarten. And, and do we, Peter, is, is, there a, is there a number where we, we feel like things are unmanageable from a class size for kindergarten? I know it's its own, it's its own thing, so. The, the largest group that I can remember from the last few years, John, I, I wanna say at one point we had, we had 45. And that's, go, that's going back a number of years. And yeah. that, that, was, that was challenging, well, it was, it was difficult. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I, I do think we need to, as part of uh, our discussions with the finance committee, and we need to get that on the calendar too, by the way, because we don't have enough in March. Um, we need to call these issues out because I think we're providing a budget that we can, that, that we legitimately can say, this is, we're pretty sure about. And there's a bunch of unknowns. And if they want us to budget for the unknowns, we can do that. But I, we want to have that discussion to understand how the town would like us to proceed. Okay. Um, and then from a capital perspective, I mean, the fire suppression system, that's a no brainer. I mean, that just needs to be done. Yep. Um, I guess the parking lot piece, um, I'd push on that from, from two ways. <laughs> One is seal coating it enough. So, you know, is, you know, how, how it, is this something that, that a seal coat is going to, that's going to buy us what? Um, and so do we, is there a need to, to do some repaving or is the seal coating, in other words, does seal coating buy us, let's just guess here, does it buy us three years or five years, but then we've spent, you know, 30,000 to get five more years out of it. And then we end up doing a full project where we have to do a bunch of repaving because clearly we can, you can see in coming up the driveway that there's been multiple, multiple pavings going along and never has it been all one at any one point. And of course, every time you do that, you end up with additional potential for water infiltration and so on and so forth. Or is it, do we need to consider some level of repaving and we need to take our time with that and get that into the capital plan from the town perspective? Um, and I do need to set time up, uh, uh, Peter, with you and, and Matt Durkee and I to kind of walk through more from a capital planning perspective of all of the various things that we can get that into the town's capital planning because there's lots of other things that the town needs to deal with and we need to get everything slotted in properly. So. I guess that's just my question there. If this buys us a decent amount of time and if we wait another year, we're like, in other words, if we can seal code it now and that buys us perhaps 10 years and if we wait another year and more water gets in there and then we might have to repave it and that costs us 100,000, then maybe it makes a lot of sense to spend that money right now. But you know, that's gonna be one of those things that I think we just need to poke on this a little bit more because this is what will be asked. And then we'll probably also, and I can do this, bring it to the town properties committee to make sure this is on their radar screen. And then, and then the, the, my guess is, is that the uh, flagpole parking spaces can go on the list, but that won't make it this year. No. 
but but it but it needs to go on that list that we're going to be putting up the capital plan for the town so it's there and can be slotted and doesn't just keep getting put at the end of the list that's not how that's not how this is supposed to work going forward we're supposed to be trying to make sure that we get all the needs out there we prioritize them and then we execute on 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 funding them I think having Matt on board is going to be a huge addition. He he's done a fantastic job. Get that scheduled too. Okay. Um, other committee members, do you have uh, other comments or thoughts on what was presented, or anything else we need to speak to with respect to the budget as we keep going on this process? And I'll reach out to FinCon to see when it is that they want us to come in for a discussion. I did offer for them to join us tonight, but they actually had a FinCon meeting tonight. So, okay. I guess we're done with budget district update. So the only thing I have tonight for the district update was that today was a professional development day and I wanted to thank uh, Assistant Superintendent Ryan Lynch and the Professional Development Council for planning a wonderful, uh, engaging um, and worthwhile day for our teachers and staff. Uh, Jimmy Cassis um, came and gave an in inspirational keynote um, and really forced us to emphasize um, living our core values and making sure that relationship building with our students is at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and I wanted to publicly thank him and the council for putting together a successful professional development day. Thank you. Okay. Any other items before we look to uh, go into executive session and adjourn the regular meeting? Um, so first of all, for the folks that are still with us, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank you for the comments that were provided that help us to continue to, to work on this plan. Um, and then um, I would therefore, I look for a motion that we can move things along here. I make a motion for us to enter into executive session, only return to regular for the purposes of adjournment. The executive session has the purpose of discussing contract discussions pursuant to MGL chapter 30A section 21A2 regarding amendment of the school bus contract. And also so we can discuss um, the ongoing negotiations with our teachers. Okay. Can I, I second. A second. Thank you, Ms. Hempel. So roll call. Ms. Hempel? Yes. Mr. Frazier? Yes. Mr. Anton? Yes. And uh, Mr. Williams is also a yes. So again, uh, thank you to everyone. Um, we'll get some uh, more information out about in the next scheduled uh, school committee meeting, uh, interim school committee meeting in case we need that. And uh, we'll put that, I'll put that up on the Friends of the Dennett site. And then also when this meeting is posted uh, to Area 58, uh, which they're hoping to do uh, hopefully by tomorrow afternoon, we'll get that up there. So folks who weren't able to attend can do that. Uh, thank you for attending and I hope you all have a good evening. <laughs>